Christ. So Memphis with some more Memphis and some Memphis up under that, if y'all get where I'm coming from. So so, so the ability to, to get a film that was talking about Memphis, and I've been to Memphis so many times, and for those who don't know, it's where Arkansas, Mississippi, and Tennessee come together, and that Mississippi just runs in it, and that Delta and that blues and everything else up at the highway makes for this thing a musical crossroads. So I'm gonna start with, and give me all, you know, please, please bear with me on this. But well, Mr. Porter, I, I want to ask you something about your upbringing, and I'm going to take it right here in the church, and what that had to do with the way in which your music came out or comes out continuously. Well, primarily, uh, like, first I'd like to say hello to everyone. Glad to be here. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to be here. It's a great opportunity to be here with you. Uh, you know, having been a part of, of, a, uh, of a church family, I think was an intricate part of what gave me uh, the, the passion and the, the connectivity with people uh, through the creative process of music. And so just being raised in the church was an intricate part of that. Additionally, that, that on, that on, a, on an intersection very near Bill Street. Bill Street is a famous tourist street in Memphis, Tennessee, ladies and gentlemen. And on, very near Bill Street, another young man, we were born four doors from each other. We were raised together. And that's Maurice White of Earth, Wind and Fire who lives in Los Angeles as well. So we were both singing in the roles here about this church early, early on, and it was a tremendous influence on my life in the music that was created through Isaac and I. All right. And Brother Bell, tell me something about your beginnings in music and, and where you drew inspiration, not just people, but the, the things that, that, that motivate you to, to write, to, to sing, to perform. Well, number one, uh, born and raised in Memphis, and uh, Again, I started in church, uh, Central Baptist on uh, <laughs> Mississippi Avenue there. So uh, David and I grew up in the same neighborhood along with Maurice and some other people. So we were all neighborhood kids right along there. And I started my career there working as a teenager off uh, Bill Street there at a club called the Flamingo Room, and I was noticed by some people at Stax and came in to do some background singing with David Porter, and then uh, next with Carla Thomas G. Wiz. That was uh, me and my group on that. So from that point, uh, just uh, was asked to do some uh, single solo things, and uh, after traveling for uh, summer in New York and different places and came home and had written a couple of songs, You Don't Miss Your Water Until Your Well Runs Dry was the first one. And I was asked to record and I did and uh, as they say, the rest is history. All right, all right. Now, I'm gonna ask you, the young whippersnapper up here in the group, all right? So growing up, were you conscious of all of this going on around you? That is the most ironic thing about all of this. I grew up, in the same neighborhood that they um, came up in, just in, in a different time period. Uh, I distinctively remember catching the bus to school where stacks used to be. And at that time, it was leveled out and it was only a plaque mm. up. So my generation at that time, we had no clue of what stacks had done before us uh, again, because they tore it down and, and our generation, we just didn't know. We didn't know at all. Um, I do remember seeing my mom with the uh, Stax records because I distinctively remember the, the, what was it, the finger snap. I remember seeing those records, but I still never knew it was right out of my neighborhood and in Memphis. So it, it was years later when I realized how serious Stax was and, and when, I, when I found out, I was completely blown away that I was right up the street from something of that magnitude. So initially, growing up in the same neighborhood as these guys in a different time period had no idea of the history that was there. And once again, I want to try to get you guys to all understand something about Memphis. So downtown Memphis is not really that big and in comparison to, you know, big metropolis like Los Angeles yeah, or New yeah, York or something yeah. like that. And you can walk down one street and you're at the Lorraine Motel. This is the place for Martin Luther King 
was killed. You know what I mean? You turn around the corner and go up a little bit, you're on Beale Street, and this is where Handy and other people were making their way as blues artists and whatever else. You go around another corner and it's, um, you know, it's Mason Temple, Church of God in Christ, where, where Martin Luther King gave his I've Been to the Mountaintop speech and where all kinds of music, and you just keep going around these corners and then Sun Records and then Stax Records and then you go on down and next thing you know there's Graceland and it's, it, it's just a whole lot going on. It's a whole lot going on. So tell me, Brother, Brother Porter, about, I, I think when young people, this movie is great because it's about intergenerational sharing. It's about stories, it's about history, but it's about making a connection between, tell me about what it really takes. I think a lot of these young people uh, see stars on TV one day, right? Reality show and whatever else, and they think that fame is about just getting noticed and then you're famous. Tell about what the real struggle as an artist is to be able to have the longevity and impact of a person like you. Well, the first thing you have to do is respect your past. And, and so the, the key thing that, that I've learned in my lifetime, I'm 73 years old in November, the key thing that I've learned in my lifetime is that all of that learning and, and trying to hook into and learn about others that were before me was the foundation of what gave Isaac Hayes and David Porter the originality that came out of us because we had an appreciation of what was before us and the motivation for finding our <coughs> place in, in life and in music was born out of that understanding of how great these individuals were with their efforts. And then to have the discipline and the motivation to take the rejection, to take the, no, we don't like it, to take all those kinds of things and, and take those as compliments to getting better rather than ways to feel bad. And using that kind of energy to, to, to really just work harder to perfect the craft. And then at the end of the day, realizing that, that when you do have some success, it means that that's the first step. And, and if you want to be great, then you've already, and you're great, and that's what you are in your mind, you'll work, you, if you're great, what, what do you need to do other than that? So we focus on not just, not the fact of trying to be great, but trying to be better. And so when we get to one level, we work to get harder to get to the next level, and we work to harder, harder to get to the next level. And we looked at it in, in that way. So consequently, when we would have one hit, we try to have the next one, and the next one on the next artist, and the next. And so those kind of motivations came from one understanding the grace that came before us, but also understanding that if you want to have a career with this thing called the music business, you first have to have the passion and love and the commitment for it that you're doing it for the for the art and for the fact that you want to have something that's worthwhile rather than doing it for the, just the, simply the monetary gain. Because at, at some point in time, if, if that's all it is, uh, that can go away very easily. <laughs> Mr. MC Al Capone, tell me something. That, and most of you guys, how many guys have seen the movie Hustle and Flow? Give it up for Hustle and Flow, all right? <laughs> tell me about that process. I mean, because that was the little movie that could. <laughs> um, it, 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 it starts off as this independent and this, and it just gains momentum. Yeah. Tell me about how you got involved with that project and what was that experience like for you? Well, uh, I was just telling uh, some of the uh, guys out, out there about it, but. Uh, actually, um, I was always an independent um, artist in Memphis, uh, along with A Ball and MJG and uh, Three Six Mafia and all of. And we had a, a distribution company uh, called Selecto Hits there that would help us uh, get our records distributed, distributed not only in Memphis but uh, across the country. Craig Brewer, the guy that wrote and directed the movie, uh, was an independent uh, film producer, and he would take his movies up there to get distributed as well. So we end up developing a relationship from going up to that, to Selecto Hits. So years later, I said maybe a couple of years later, um, I always try to keep in touch with people and, and I reached out to him just really to speak to him, say, see how he was doing and everything. And he just so happened to tell me right at the, on, and during that conversation that uh, John Singleton is gonna produce Hustle and Flow and John will be in town tomorrow. <laughs> he really wants 3 Six Mafia to do all the music because he already worked with them and Baby Boy, but he will see if he'll come down and check out something that I can uh, contribute. And they was looking for the theme song. So that night I wrote uh, uh, the Hustle and Flow, Keep Hustling. I wrote that uh, song, went to the studio, got it produced. So when he came in the next day, they heard it, they loved it. So while they were talking about that, I just started playing some of my personal songs. And Whoop That Trick was like one of my songs that was being played at the time. 
And when they heard it, they the first thought was, we actually need a song that that evolved before he does the keep hustling and flowing, which is more smooth and laid back and soulful. We need a more gritty song to, just so we can see his growth. So he came to me and said, well, uh, do you think you can rewrite this for the character in the movie? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you ain't gotta ask me twice. I can do this in my sleep, you know what I'm saying? So that ended up coming about him. Uh, actually, I ended up with another song that played in the scene and, and got a little small cameo with um, Ludacris and Juicy J. And, it's just one thing led into another, you know what I'm saying? So uh, that's, that's how it all came about, and I'm very thankful, the grace of God, and you know, a lot of things happened after that. Yeah. Did y'all hear what he said about he's the type of person who likes to keep in contact with people? Yeah. That he keeps mm -hmm. in contact, that this was just about him continuing that process, which was who you are, and then opportunity was right there. What did say? Luck is when preparation meets opportunity, right? If I wouldn't have made that call, just to keep in touch. Not to say, do you have something for me? It's simply, how you doing? Mm. You know what I'm saying? If I wouldn't have made that call, none of that would have ever happened. Now, Mr. Bell, tell me about working with Snoop Dogg and tell me about this new record. Well, Snoop and I just hit it off from day one. Uh, and uh, in talking with him, I uh, found out that he was a student businessman. He was a student of the music. And uh, so we just vibed together. And uh, it was just a joy working with him because there was no, he's for real, you know, he, there's no pretense and everything. And we came in and uh, it was like uh, we had known each other for 20 years. And uh, so from that point on, it was just great to be uh, collaborating with him. And like I said, when he sat down and he heard that, the things that I had dropped on the uh, track, and he said, oh, wow, man. He went in and just created it because he was feeling it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tell us the title of the song again. The title of the song is I Forgot to Be Your Lover, which is actually one of my older tunes from back in the 60s that, um, of course, uh, it's been covered by Billy Idol. Uh, he sold oh God, about eight or 10 million on it with a tune called uh, To Be A Lover. And uh, then it's been, it was covered by Jaheem, Ludacris, and quite a few other folk. Uh, but it's been a good song, it's been a good uh, track for me, and so I figured uh, we would do that one, and uh, I'm glad I did. They released it as the first initial single from the soundtrack, and we are getting a lot of hits on uh, on the YouTube and different places from it, so uh, it's just a joy. We've got a also a huge uh, wax bringing it back, bringing the <laughs> back to the future, right? Uh, but uh, the single is also uh, on a three CD compilation with, uh, of course, me and Snoop, and then Bobby and Lil Peanut and uh, Otis Clay, along with uh, Frasier Boy. All right, you guys, we're going to open up for about two questions. Then the, I know sometimes you're like, well, we want to do this. We got something else going on. You're going to get to hear um, this music because you're going to hear it live. We're going to be performing and everything else. We've got a great show for you. So uh, let me see. Is there anybody who has a question out there? Anybody has a question? Anybody with a question? Yes. This way, everybody can hear you. Gentlemen, how are you? Um, I, I had a quick question, man. This is about sampling. Um, you know, a lot of the songs that you did, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, you know, did you ever, and, and of course, sampling wasn't even around at the time, but, you know, what is the feeling that you get now knowing that Cats is sampling your record? Like, what is that feeling like when you turn on the radio and it's a Mariah record or, or, or some artist who has sampled your record or even a piece of it or a lyric or a, 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 a hi-hat or whatever it was? Um, what is that feeling like? Well, I'll start off. Uh, it's an affirmation of uh, your product and your creativity through your career. Um, there's nothing wrong with technology, uh, what we're trying to instill in younger people is to be creative and cre create new
product because individuality is what really makes an artist. And we need some new things that if we want to sample something, so some new things, new music to sample from. So we're trying to create that love for the creative process and to collaborate with other genres of music and other musicians and singers and stuff because that's what's going to make for a better product. So, uh, but I'm all for uh, just being wide open when it comes to creativity. For me, it's been an interesting thing for me because, like you said, I never imagined all of the samples, that kind of thing happening with, my, with, with the songs. I mean, the first person that I heard that was a big fan was a guy by the name of Biggie Smalls, Notorious B.I.G. And so someone had told me years ago that he had made an audition tape with a song of mine. And there was an interview that was done with me and they, they gave me a cassette copy of that. And they said because of this young man's popularity, a lot of talents would ultimately end up looking to find material on me. And I never thought very much about that until <laughs> things start snowballing from there. The, uh, Mariah Carey, Dream Lover, I'm the third writer on Dream Lover. That's the, the song that she used to, for the song for that particular song was a song that I did on a, a group called The Emotions called Blind Alley. Well, Blind Alley ended up being sampled not only by Mariah Carey, which did about 30 million albums on that, but also Rex in Effect, a song called Rump Shaker, that's Blind Alley. Uh, a song on, on Belle Bill DeVoe, Above the Rim, that's Blind Alley. I mean, Blind Alley has been one of the most sample songs in the history of that whole genre of sampling. And then you got, uh, you know, uh, uh, Will Smith with Getting Jiggy With It, another sample, co-writer of that because of that. So there's a whole laundry list of, of, of a great number of songs that I've never in my wildest dream imagined happening for me. But the key thing that we were focusing on was creating material that would have hopefully connectivity with people feeling and passion, what we call soulfulness with people. And our songs were created back in the day with a sense of creating a, a message that was motivational in its intent. Hold On I'm Coming was really an idea about motivation, making people feel good about being there for someone and knowing it's a, in a reassuring way that you'll always be. Never imagine in, in the future that it would end up being a, a, a part of a, of a sample catalog for us. All right, one more question, there we go. Oh, there is Mr. Barry Benson record executive extraordinaire way back uh, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> no give it up though for real this is uh Barry Benson one of the first DJs to play a full rap catalog on the west coast um before people will talk about K-Day was the first, you know, that was playing, but there was actually a station called KUCR in the Inland Empire that was playing full rap all the way, all during that time period. One of the first people in terms of when rap began to be accepted by kind of the, the mainstream as one of the people who was able to articulate what that meant to record executives. He's been on the digital, uh, uh, the, uh, the digital revolution, all the rest of these kinds of things. So give it up for, as I said, Barry Benson, but you got a question. So I want to let y'all know who you're talking to and how, you know. We got in the room here. Well, thank, you. thank you, Dr. Walker. We went to college together too, and he also pledged me. So, uh, you know, so give it up for Dr. Walker too. And let's put it in there. By the way, my brother, I just had a comment. Um, number one, I wanted to say kudos to everybody here on the panel. Um, I'm a huge, I'm a huge, huge fan. I worked for Rhino Records for a decade. Basically, I was in charge of the catalog for Aretha Franklin and John Coltrane. And, and a lot of other, a lot of other uh, I, folks, and some of you up here that have been on compilations and things I've seen over the years. So I just want to give you props. Here's my question. One thing I saw in the movie was that I loved was at the, at the end I saw the kids that were in the academy and they were inter, you know interfacing with a lot of the band members. And one thing I saw that was interesting was I think was the was the guitar player who was interacting with Skip, and Skip was basically saying to him, "It's feeling. It's not so much technique." And my question to you is, since the 80s, Reaganomics came in, at least here in Southern California, a lot of high school, pro high school programs, jazz programs, band programs disappeared. Um, what's your feeling in Memphis, and what do you see in terms of where kids are right now that are getting back to playing and, and, and the approach to, you know, bottom line, jamming and, 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 and basically 
putting together, um, you know, the, really the, the, the art of where the music came from, which is really improvisation and just instrumentation and innovation. <laughs> well, do you want to you want touch it? Uh, in Memphis is an interesting place. We have a go ongoing right, right now program in Memphis called the Consortium MMT. And what we're doing, in addition to what's happening at the Stax Museum, we're working with young songwriters, record producers, and recording artists, giving them the techniques that we've used, and hopefully they'll take whatever those ideas are and incorporate it, that into their creativeness and have uh, some sense of what they ultimately will make their music become in the marketplace. And so we're freely giving that. When I say we, I'm talking about some of the greatest talents in the business. They're in, on film, they're coming to Memphis in person. Everybody from, from Jimmy Jam to uh, Valerie Simpson to Earth, Wind and Fire to, uh, it's just so many artists who freely are trying to give back to young talents because uh, education, music education, and the arts have been compromised in our school systems all across the country. And so there's a passion for that. The Stax Museum, uh, it, which is what you've seen there, there there's a, it's a charter school, a high school, and it graduates every student with full scholarships across this country. So there is a passion in, in our community to give back to the music industry that was so good for the community in meaningful ways. And uh, to, to make it further, you know, these kids are so wide open when it comes to learning and they're like little sponges. They just take in everything that that you tell them and give them and soak it up. And I've worked with the uh, Stax kids uh, from the very beginning and uh, I've, I've had them with me in concerts on a couple of occasions and uh, we took them to the Smithsonian and did concerts there for three days and they just wowed the people. So this is just great to be able to mentor and to give back and to work with these kids and, and teach them the rudiments of the music and everything and to follow their careers as they uh, graduate and go on. And we uh, have had five students already to uh, earn uh, full four-year scholarships to Berkeley from the uh, academy there. So it, it's just uh, a joy to, to be a part of that. Thank you. All right, everybody, once again, give it up for our illustrious panel. I am truly honored that on the first, the inaugural Long Attending, we had a movie like Take Me to the River, and we had the talents of Mr. David Porter. Give it up. Yeah. Of Mr. Alfred Holmes. And a Mr. William Bell.